You have 15 minutes. Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Portland. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Lunen. We've got a little bit of a matchup here for you. We've got JC Tao, though I actually have him playing against Michael Hans on our on my sheet here, so I'm wondering if we need to update players our graphic. We'll take a look at that. In the meantime, players are off to, off to a quick start here, Jake. They're just blazing right through. Obzon Control versus Black Green Delirium. Yeah, there we go. That is Michael on the left-hand side. And you can see that JC's got a couple of tap lands here, but also a traverse the Olven Wall to uh, further fix his mana. This is going to be a grindy match. Uh, both these decks pretty mid rangey. It's kind of funny, JC going for the second run through on his traverse. Where is that <laughs> land he's looking for? Uh oh, it's not in his hand. Oh, there it is. <laughs> he's going to have to get a swamp or something instead. <laughs> Let's see what he ends up with here. Wait, does his <laughs> hand have all of his basics? No, I think. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> all right. He does have something to get. It wasn't exactly what he wanted. It might not match up perfectly with how he planned it out. But the truth is, if he has those lands in his hand, it'll, it'll work out for him anyway. <laughs> so JC's going to grab a swamp and then shift the turn back over to Michael. Both players have now played a Traversal Ovenwald in the early stages. And here's a Transgress the Mine from the Black Green deck. We have seen uh, Transgress do some really good work here this weekend. It, you know, takes a, it kind of picks apart some of these ramp decks when they're trying to go up to Big Emrakul and stuff like that. Though I will say Traverse has done a very good job of mitigating that, right? You know, if you've got yep. four Traverse and, you know, three Emrakul or even four or two or one, you know, you can take away an Emrakul or a big threat in the early stages with this uh, Transgress, but then they just draw any, you know, they have seven outs or something to, to find another one. It looks like he's going to take away Nissa Vasswood Seer, though, this time. Traverse is so good because of its versatility. You know, in the early game when you're <coughs> trying to hit your land drops, trying mm. to set up your mana, it does really well. And later on in the game, it's obviously one of the best draw steps you could possibly have. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, they're dropping like flies here. JC plays the Den Protector, but Michael's going to waste no time in Grass of Darkness on that. And now you can see... Why JC was going for that planes, though, again, with it in his hand, it didn't matter. But here we go. Gideon, Ally of Zendikar. And now all of a sudden, Michael's facing a real threat here. Let's see if he's got an answer for it. We haven't seen a lot of Gideons in main decks as of late, but mm. uh, seems to be very strong here. Definitely one of the most powerful cards legal and standard. Wow, it sure was. Ruinous Path zaps that guy right out of here. Of course, you can see the power of a card like... Gideon, though, he's left behind a knight token, and that thing gets to start chipping away for damage. Yeah, it's just a lot of free value there for him. Well, Planeswalkers keep flowing here for JC Tao as well. He's got Liliana, the last hope. He's going to minus Liliana, and he's going to find himself a Sylvan Advocate out of his graveyard and play it this turn as well. So another productive turn for JC. He's really been firing in all cylinders, even though he's been answered, you know, at most stages here. The Den Protector, actually, I think that uh, he played it so he played it early, mm. um, and uh, you know, traditional school of thought in a grindier matchup is that you don't play your Den Protector until you also have the mana to flip it up so yeah. you can protect him that way. Yeah. But he ran it out there on turn three, uh, <coughs> forcing his opponent to play a removal spell and to stay off the board, and then he knew that he had the Liliana in his hand so that he would be able to set up the turn on turn five where he could get a Sten Protector back, and then also play the Sylvan Advocate in his hand. He had the Sylvan Advocate in hand. Yeah, I so see. he's wow. playing a, a few turns ahead here. That's some good planning there from JC. It's nice stuff, and it really does force the issue when you play the Den Protector face down. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, Michael's looking at it like, well, that's kind of reckless of you, but I also have to kill that now. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't let him get back or traverse or something like that. So I like it. I, I like that kind of aggressive stance, you know, from JC with, with playing out his threats like that. That makes a lot of sense. And the fact that you're playing Den Protector and Liliana side by side, too, is really strong. Indeed. All 
All right, well, Michael's got a nice play here with Nissa, but he's going to need something else. You know, uh, just playing a Nissa here is not going to get the job done. Yeah, it looks like he's falling behind. We've seen a lot of Nissas this weekend. We've talked about that quite a bit. Ah, he just passed the turn back with nothing else. And JC, look at him laugh. He's like, this was exactly my plan. <laughs> He's going to plus Liliana targeting Nyssa. And he has hit his sixth mana, or sixth land, excuse me, so he's jamming. And I mean, worst case scenario here for JC is that he's playing a Den Protector face down, flipping it up, and then getting back something like a dead weight to deal with the Nyssa or a Gideon to just blow the game wide open. going to take the hit. And then there's that Den Protector that we saw get killed, rebought, and now replayed. So JC, not... Uh, you know, one of the options he had there was to get back the dead weight and kill the Nissa immediately. Yeah. Uh, instead, using the den protector, uh, or leaving it face down so that he has more options, depending on what Michael actually does here. Yeah, he's got some nice targets in his yard there. He can get a traverse. Yeah, and that traverse or a could Gideon. Be very good. Yeah, right now, if he gets the traverse, that actually does take him off of delirium. He would have planeswalker enchantment land if he were to take that traverse away, but he can get it back pretty easily. You know, there's a lot of ways that can happen. Or he could just take Gideon and just be like, here, here's a Gideon. Yeah. <laughs> not, not a bad play either. Uh, here's Liliana, the last hope now for Michael, who's also added a Sylvan Advocate to his board. Interesting there that he chose to play the Sylvan Advocate before playing Liliana. Okay, well, he's plusing the Liliana. There we go. And we'll also note that Michael has six lands himself, so the... Uh, Himself an advocate is, is charged up as well. JC is currently smaller than its normal self. You can see it's gone flipped upside on its head. That's just JC reminding himself that Liliana has cast her glare upon him. At least until Michael's next turn. It's weak in the knees. It's interesting though that the Gideon in the graveyard is actually very strong here. Although he does have a lot of different options and I wouldn't be surprised to see what he takes. All right, there's Gideon. That's what he decided to go for. It makes yeah. sense. It's just the most cleanly powerful play he could take out of the, the yard. Again, the traverse would be something he'd need to work for for a little bit further down the line. But just picking up a Gideon here looks pretty good. And there are a lot of plays you can make here with the Gideon. I'm actually not that opposed to even just minusing the Gideon immediately. Just making an emblem? Yeah. There, I, there are arguments to be made both ways, though. And I think depending on whether or not he feels that he has the long game here, I think, you know, I think the JC is going through that exact same thought process right now, Jake, about considering his options with the Gideon. And he's got two other cards in his hand as well. Could also factor in. Okay, obviously, he, do he doesn't want to, you know, commit too many resources to a board when he uh, could be worried about the entire thing getting swept in some way or another. But sure. at the same time, he also wants to close the game if he thinks that his opponent has access to, you know, the bigger Emerge cards or yeah. MR Cool. And you see one of the ways he might have been thinking as well. So he, he shrunk down his opposing advocate and then attacked Liliana with the Den Protector. If he would have made an emblem, Den Protector would have killed Liliana there. So, you know, that's one consideration that, that JC yeah. was probably going through. How important is it to get Liliana to zero here versus one? We know the difference between, you know, four and one is huge, right? Because now... 
Michael doesn't have the option to minus Liliana for card advantage, right? Correct. Where before he did. And so JC's going to sell for that. He's going to say, you know what? It, if you want to plus Liliana, one of my creatures, I can live with that. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be back next turn to attack her again, <laughs> you know. And in the meantime, I'm just going to play my Gideon and build out my board even wider. Yeah, Michael's still pretty far behind here, although Snissa flipping could help a bit. So this is going to make an Ashaya token. Is going to do the only thing that Liliana can do here on the one loyalty. Yeah, interesting the uh, the options here. I think if he wants to be pressuring his opponent's planeswalkers, then it's pretty important to shrink that advocate right now. But at the same time, if he wants his planeswalkers to stay in play for the following turn, then he really needs to shrink down that den protector. So there's that push and pull. This is a really difficult decision. There have already been a lot of decision trees here. Yeah, this has been an interesting game. You know, kind of a classic mid-range fight here as we've got a lot of things going on with multiple creatures and even multiple planeswalkers for both players. And that does present you with a lot of different options to kind of parse through and figure out. I mean, you really have to be good at assessing where do I stand in this game? If this game goes for five more turns, who wins? How does that look? What, what are the options that my opponent can draw here that really wreck my day? And here the, uh, the Gideon emblem, obviously uh, even more tempting now than the turn before. Still, I, I also like just making a token. I think that there are very strong arguments to be made for both of those plays. I think with the uh, the pair of creature lands that Chechen has in play, also that that gives more of an edge to minus and Gideon. Oh, is he lining up? Have you seen Quagmire here? He's kind of flopping his lands around. What's going on? Oh. oh, he's got Languish. Oh, wow. Yeah, that changes everything. He's going to Languish himself, which is a bold play, right? I mean, that killed four creatures of his. Yeah, but because <coughs> of you can see Gideon's plus one ability. Yeah, you can see the reason. <laughs> My <laughs> Goodness. So now he's JC envisioned this board state and said, okay, let's just assume that I lose my creatures here, but my opponent loses their board. So they lose their creatures and their planeswalkers after this attack is finished up. So the board at the end of it is me with Liliana on four, Gideon on five. My opponent with the hissing quagmire is the only possible attacker. Am I happy with that? Is that an advantageous position. Can I do better than that? And JC said, no, that looks pretty good. I'll do that. Yeah. And it looks pretty good from here. It does. Oh, well, it did a minute, at least until now. The, the Ishkanah could be an issue, though. Absolutely. I, Ishkanah is just so powerful. And the fact that it creates that many bodies means it's really good at pressuring. Oh, and a traverse as well. Wow, Michael really had the goods here, didn't he? Let's just see what he finds here. He took one pass through and didn't find what he wanted. That's because Emrakul was in those first three cards, and he kind of went past her. And yeah. I, that's pretty rough for JC. You know, that assuming that Michael rough. can cast Emrakul next turn, he just went Ishkanah to make sure he doesn't die or, you know, manage this board a bit, and then he's just going to cast Emrakul. And, you know, one of the things that we learned at the Pro Tour was that when, you have, when you're the one with the Planeswalkers on the battlefield, they actually become quite a liability in a lot of situations with, a, with an Emrakul. That doesn't look too bad for JC here, though. Gideon's hard to manage on five. Like, if you minus Gideon down to one, 
eh. Like, you just give your opponent an emblem. It's not really the end of the world for JC. It's also hard to make Luliana too much of a disaster. You basically get to take two loyalty off of her for no effect. It's a shame that JC doesn't have access <coughs> to some sort of discard spell in his graveyard so that he can minus the Liliana, get back Den Protector, and then use that to get back the discard spell and take the em Emrakul out of Michael's hand. But, but there's nothing. There's nothing here. Wow, it looks so good for JC when he passed the turn, and it looks so daunting now. I mean, this is nice. Like, he Oath of Nisses, he finds it. Nissa Vast would see her. That's fine. He's going to be able to play the land, transform her, get some cards going. But here we go. Yeah, this is Emrakul's quite gonna scary. Hit. The question is just how much havoc can Michael Hans re wreak on uh, <laughs> on JC? I'm guessing quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! All right, so he revealed Soren Grim Nemesis, and that means that uh, Michael is uh -oh. going to be able to use that Soren Grim Nemesis. It's about the worst thing that could happen for JC there. That's pretty bad. <laughs> wow. I mean, he can use the minus ability on Soren Grim Nemesis and kill the Soren Grim Nemesis and another one of these Planeswalkers. That's right. So you can minus X from Soren. <coughs> Pardon me. And it deals, and Soren deals X damage to a creature or Planeswalker, and you gain X life. But like you said, you can just minus the full six, which is Soren starting loyalty, and just point that at another Planeswalker, and then they're both gone. Yuck. I mean, Michael's thinking about things, but he's yeah. going to cast him <laughs> cool, and he does. And he was actually deciding if he had any possible attacks, but he decides, no, I don't. So it's Soren land here for JC. But as, we, as we've seen so many times, you know, it, Michael looks like he's going to be in a position to be able to take down a couple of these planeswalkers. JC's going to lose at least the, the ally, the knight ally token. Probably about it, right? Uh, you know, it'll probably be somewhere in that range. Maybe he'll find a way to get another card off the battlefield if he's got enough mana for a creature land or whatever. But the real problem here for JC is that he's going to not have an answer for Emrakul. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most powerful parts about the Mind Slaver trigger from Emrakul is that you, if your opponent has a card that deals with this giant 13-13 creature, then you can just get it out of their hands. Yeah, and th I think and that they that's have one draw step. Yeah, and that part about the card feels a little bit lower on the scale than oh, I killed your planeswalker with your other planeswalker, and two of your creatures attacked into my creatures and died, and then I used a removal spell on your, you know, like. That stuff feels a lot more flashy, but what tends to end the game is that they can just empty your hand of ways to deal with a 13-13 Flying Trample. And yeah. And I was give surprised. Give you a draw step or two. We didn't see more of cards like Planner Outburst this weekend. Cards where, you know, <coughs> even when your opponent slavers you, you still, you, you're they guaranteed can't do anything. to get it off the yeah, table. just yeah. going to kill Emerald. But as we see, we've got Languishes and that kind of card here from JC, so. Okay, so to kick things off, Michael's going to cast... Soren, on behalf of JC Tau. And then he has to decide if he wants to kill Nyssa or Liliana. The thinking being, what gives JC the best chance to find one of those few answers to Emrakul on his turn? Because he's only going to have two turns to find that answer. And the basic thinking on that would be if he ta decides to kill Liliana, that means that Den Protector is the card he cares about, which means that there would already be an answer in the graveyard for Emrakul, which I don't currently see. So I think killing Nyssa makes more sense because she's going to find you a yeah. card or two extra, and it looks like as, we, as I say this, Michael's uh, doing this, so it looks like he agrees. And this really limits the outs that JC has, because how is JC going to kill Michael through Ishkana and friends plus Emrakul? That's not going to happen. It doesn't seem likely. Yeah, it doesn't seem likely. And JC 
is going to die to Emrakul in just two turns, even after the six life gain. That is kind of interesting, though. I don't. JC pointed down at the shambling vent there, and he's actually got a pair of shambling vents, and that actually could gain him enough life to take an additional hit from Emrakul. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of interesting things going on here also because I'm I'm not sure. Oh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem that JC has access to his own uh, copy of Emrakul in the main deck. Because otherwise... He doesn't I'm have... A oh, he doesn't play it in the main? No, he doesn't have one uh, in the main. Yeah, and this I is the Obzon list. It's a little different than this black-green. And, and, and one of the big problems with that is right now, I mean, if he had access to that one card, he could minus his Liliana, get back Den Protector, use the Traverse, and find it, and then take that one hit, and then try Trade to break Serve there. Whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, that would give him options, but as it sits, it doesn't look like it's going to be. Yikes. So why don't you take a look at the list? What does he have that kills Emrakul? Well, again, he has a copy, or two copies of Omnixilis, Reignited. Okay. Um, he has an Anguished Unmaking. Okay. Uh, that's an instant, right? Yeah, oh yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Um, does he have any Ruinous Path in there? He has one copy. Yeah. Just so the one? Yeah. All right. JC so. Tau's drawn thin, but, it, you know, three. He's yeah. Okay, there's another Soren. That could also gain him some more life. But, you know, you can see he's got that Nissa now, and he's going to use that to, to draw cards again. You know, he got one right back on the battlefield here. <laughs> and this is getting interesting, right? Now, now if he's going to draw two cards a turn, maybe he can whittle away while gaining some incidental life from Soren and from Shambling Vent to put him on a three-turn clock rather than a two-turn clock and just whittle away at Ishkana and, and Spiders and maybe make this into a race of some sort. Who knows? Looks like he's going to build out his board for now, though, and that I'm assuming that that Soren is, is still in his hand. Yeah, I mean, if you're Michael here, don't you really want to be attacking Planeswalkers, actually? You know, I, I That's think... That's Well, odd. so I think that originally the answer to that was no, right? I think that you go, hit you, go... Like, you have to kill me right now or I kill you next turn. But given the life gain and the fact that it's going to take three turns to kill JC anyway, it very, very well may be correct to just, like, attack Nissa here, mm -hmm. cut him off of his flow of cards, and decide to play a slightly longer game. If it's going to go along anyway, you don't want to sit there and watch JC draw, you know, three or four extra cards. Yeah, this is becoming a very interesting game, even though we've already seen the Rockle cast. This is sweet. Yeah. This whole game's been interesting. This is still game one. Like at every turn, there's been something going on that has been a difficult decision. You know, think back to just a few turns ago. JC was passing the turn with a pair of Planeswalkers with tons of loyalty on them to an empty board, and Michael seemed to just turn it around all at once with Ishkana and Traverse the Elvenwald. And now it looks like things could really go either way. Okay, so interesting. Michael's decided to attack Planeswalkers, as we discussed. But in this case, it's going to be Gideon. And then there was a bit of, of a flurry there. But what I'm assuming happened is that was play Den Protector, turn it face up, get back Ruinous Path, kill your other Planeswalker. Yeah, he, like you tapped eight, yeah, he tapped eight mana, put the morph yeah. in, and flipped it up, and then pointed at the thing. So yeah, I'm assuming he just a, announced it. It's a little <laughs> tough for us to see from the booth without being able to hear the players because they're probably verbalizing this stuff. But we can... They're not making it easy on us. You know, we just see, like, Den Protectors cast face up while Planeswalkers disappear and nothing else <laughs> happening. But, but so it goes. Uh, I'm assuming that's the, the line that was taken there. Okay, so here's the Soren Grim Nemesis that we saw last turn. It's a shame he's not playing in a Markle of his own that he could, you know, just... Flip up. 
Must not have room for it in these ops on control lists. Maybe they just don't get enough delirium going. I mean, they're certainly not playing many cards that are actively trying to get it, you know? I mean, he's only playing one copy of Traverse. Yeah, that's a good point. Healthy enough life total. Now to take a few, few hits from the octopus. Okay, time to attack. It doesn't really look like there are any good blocks here. And you probably do want to be chump blocking just to preserve life total because you know, you're the one with the 13-13. But the thing is, I think Michael's completely out of gas here. You mean in hand? Yeah. However, there are a lot of cards in this Black Green Delirium deck that just solve that problem immediately. I mean, do you, is he just straight up behind now? Like, even with Emrakul out? Is that what um, you're saying? Like, he's out of cards, but, like, can he still just manage to win this game by mowing down Planeswalkers with Emrakul and blocking with Spiders? Or is I mean, that off he, the table now? I don't think just on board he would be comfortable with winning. I mean, he, he got the first draw step. I still think Michael is more likely to win this game. But I don't think it is... I, I think he's, you know, a 65 percenter to win this game. I don't think that. Yeah, not locked up by any stretch. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. This has been, <laughs> you know, it's the first match in the first game of the day, but this has been a heck of a good game between these two. Yeah, I feel like this is the best game I've seen all weekend. Also, I, I will note that um, if this is the type of magic you like, it's going to be a really good day for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going to love this they, new standard. They, these... These uh, matchups have gone in a similar fashion all day. We've had significant number of players going to extra turns and getting unintentional draws. Um, it's it's going to be a long day of standard here. It's really interesting, too, because it, the game could be so different in so many different ways, depending on how people activated Planeswalkers and sequenced the way they played their creatures. Yeah. I think both players could be in better position right now. Both players could be in much worse position right now. And it's if they made plays that were, you know, six to one, half a dozen the other, that just plays that don't look right or wrong in comparison to one another. So super play intensive standard format right now from the look of it. And it looks like Michael is going to use up some of these spiders two of them to finish off Soren and clean up all the Planeswalkers from JC. Finally, he's got them all gone. All right. And now, you know, Michael really looking to capitalize here yeah, the on lands having are... the biggest creature on the battlefield that's very difficult to get rid of. But JC is really maneuvering nicely with these creature lands. Yeah, I mean, these these are big creatures right now. I think that they're huge. Like, with that advocate, especially. Yeah, that's the deal. It's a 4 5 shambling vent with lifelink. Like, even against Emrakul, that's significant, right? And I think Michael just has that, uh, the only land he can really block with. I think JC's got this. Uh, he may have grasp in his hand, and then. You're yeah. right. He drew grasp so with he gets darkness to attack for the and turn. 10, 10 damage that can't be blocked. And Wow. Yeah. So JC Tau has multiple Planeswalkers down, faces down Emrakul. <laughs> Michael gets to attack with Emrakul two or three times that game. And this is after a lot. I mean, remember, this is that game where JC had the languish to leave himself with two Planeswalkers against a virtually empty board. Yeah, that <laughs> was in a very exciting game. And I think JC that wins. My God. All those creature lands in play, the whole game, just this, they were like this ticking time bomb. We were wondering when they were going to matter a lot. And they, they mattered a few different times, but that last turn, the combination of Sylvan Advocate with his and Quagmire and Shambling Vent is just so strong. Take a look at Christian Keith versus uh, Jin Sui. Jin Su. We've got uh, game three action. <laughs> JPL. <laughs> 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 They're a few turns into game three as uh, our game one was finishing up on our main match. Ooh, this is my favorite deck in the new format, by the way. What do you like? What is it? Four-color Amalgam? Yeah. 
Tell us about it. All right, so the deck ag aggressively uses uh, Jace Friend's Prodigy, Gather the Pack, uh, Grab from the Pass, just all of the cards that fill the graveyard, uh, so that it can fill the graveyard with cards like Prized Amalgam and Haunted Dead. Then it uses Haunted Dead to bring back a whole bunch of Prized Amalgams. Haunted Dead works really well with the Emerge spells. The thing that's most impressive about the deck is that you get to play with Jace Friend's Prodigy, where it's basically flipping right away. So you're playing with old Jace. It's like playing Jace back when fetch lands were in the format, That's only cool. even better. That's cool. And you know, Jace Friend's Prodigy, in a vacuum, one of the most powerful cards in standard, if not the most powerful card in standard. And if you're able to flip it right away, then it really is able to unlock all of that incredible potential there. Especially can you're, because you've already got that graveyard loaded up as well, though. It does look like Jin may have uh, missed with Gather the Pack. Well, yeah. At least he got to transform his Jace right away. He definitely whiffed there with the gather. Brutal. The stage. And here, this, as we see, you know, Jace just. Oh, well, this is actually pretty good for Christian. Christian seems to have been able to exile two copies of Prized Amalgam. And, you know, one of the major strengths of these Prized Amalgam strategies is that as the game gets deeper, you end up with multiple copies of that in your graveyard. And then every single time you have the board wiped, you can just use a card like Haunted Dead. And mm. then your board is this huge, you know, thing again. That's an Evolving Wilds. What version is that? Old one? Oh, look at that land. Oh, wow. That's kind of cool. Guru Forest there from Jin. That is gorgeous. He has really pretty lands over here. It's a like Guru Island there, too. Oh, I just got shivers. Ugh. I have those on Magic Online, but sadly not in real life. <laughs> Man, they are playing fast. No wonder this is going so quickly. You see how <laughs> this is a much different vibe than our than our other match, though. As as the board sits, they're both at twenty life and don't really have a whole lot going on, at least as far as the battlefield goes. But that time he did not miss with Gather the Pack. One of the things that's so strong about this four color amalgam deck too is that Haunted Dead and Prized Amalgam combo so nicely with the emerge cards. And with cards like Gather the Pack and Grab from the Past, it's really easy to set up uh, a hand where you have multiple copies of Elder Deep Fiend. And then once you make one of these boards where you have a decent amount of power, you can kind of just chain together those Elder Deep Fiends, tapping all of your opponent's relevant lands or all of their blockers turn after turn, and just get in for two big attacks, and it's usually enough to just win the game right there. I had an opportunity to talk to... Uh, Justin Cohen, who's also playing Four Color Amalgam. Mm, and mm -hmm. I, he was he kind of near the top tables for a lot of it, right? Yeah, now now he's X-1-1. He was very disappointed in himself. He said the deck has a lot of complex play to it, and uh, he doesn't feel that the deck lost matches so much as... Oh, the first match is back? Yeah, so much as he's, uh, <laughs> you know, just losing because he hasn't practiced enough with the strategy. He said he only really played eight games against Bant. Coming okay. In. Well, let's jump over and, and see our first match. It does look like it's back underway, though. If it's anything like the first game, it'll take a little while. Transgress the mind here from JC Tao. Ooh, those are some neat ones. Seasons Pass, Dark Petition, Traverse the Oven Wilds. Wow, looks like, yeah, he's consulted the sideboard significantly here, doesn't it? Seasons Past obviously seems very strong against these Abzan control style decks. And if, you, if they want to be playing that game, Seasons Past seems like exactly what you could do to just go completely over the top of it. Yeah, JC, no copies of Miracle on a sideboard either. He's just completely bypassed it, huh? Yeah. <coughs> Sideboard pretty interesting here, though. He has quite a few one ofs. A one of Caustic Caterpillar. 
which is essentially like having two disenchant effects because of the traverse in his main deck. Players are playing pretty quickly here. I, I, I do get the vibe that they both know. We've got to be careful, you know. So we're going to see Grass of Darkness immediately take care of itself an advocate. But JC's kind of moving his game plan forward here with Anissa. Easy there, boys. Don't get too far ahead of yourselves. But no removal spell there for Michael on end step. He had three mana untapped and used none of it for the turn. It's got to be a little awkward. Could fall behind. You know, you don't want to miss a beat here in standard. Let's see what he has this turn, though. Oh, must, must be... That's strange. All right, well, he's got a Sylvan Advocate. Now he's going to play a uh, Traverse. Yeah, the, uh, both these decks are very good at catching up. So, you know, a lot of the time you'll see somebody not do anything on their turn three. And if that's happening to, let's say, a Bank Company deck, mm -hmm. that's disastrous for them. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, when we're watching a this type of matchup, I really feel like it, you know, the big turns are going to be turns six through nine. Okay. We'll keep an eye on those. Now, this is a big turn for JC, though. He's played Oath of Liliana. Ooh. And nabbed that poor, helpless Sylvan Advocate there. And it looks like JC, you know, we saw four different Planeswalkers from him in that first game. I <laughs> Maybe he's found a way to grind it out even harder here with that oath. Very interesting too. That oath kind of, kind of acting like uh, an additional planeswalker in the mid stage of the game. Wow! When and is this all that Michael can do with his turn here? Is just attack for two damage? You got to think like this is going to favor JC in a pretty big way, right? The thing is, is we know that Michael has both Dark Petition and Seasons Past in his in his hands. Okay. So he just didn't want to cast it. All right. Well, here's Anissa again from JC, and he's going to transgress. Whoop, easy. Oh, and after that pair of transgresses, now Michael just has. Nothing. Nothing. So. Definitely favors JC at this point. Yeah, it, this is tough for Michael. It looks like he's whittled down to so little that all he can do is keep attacking with a hissing quagmire. Really not his primary game plan. And uh, the only good news for Michael, well, I was going to, maybe I spoke too soon. Is that I was going to say is that JC has really only been able to chip away with this Nissa and hasn't really put out anything massive, but now Obnixilus plus an additional zombie thanks to the Oath is going to make life difficult for Michael. He's going to fall significantly behind if he doesn't have some really fortuitous top decks in the next turn or two. I mean, that Nissa is even going to be flipping into a Planeswalker on the following turn. And now he's staring down at Obnixilus with six counters. It just seems absolutely disastrous for him. It's tough, too, because that first game was sweet, right? You know, he played well. There was a good fight. He played Emrakul. Didn't win that one, but was fighting the fight. And now this one, it looks like he's kind of had his hand torn apart by JC, who's, you know, been able to put forth just enough of his game plan here with a couple of Planeswalkers incoming and a zombie and some removal spells. Yeah, I, this surprises me because coming into this weekend, Abzan, you know, this very mid rangey style deck, I wasn't sure how this would perform when people were able to go so far over the top. But it seems that JC's really been able to use his uh, discard spells effectively, his sideboard effectively, and he's even, you know, beating Emrakul's when they're successfully cast against him. So. Totally. Very impressive stuff. JC's going to chump lock with that uh, zombie there, the Hissing Quagmire, of course, receiving benefits from the. Uh Sylvan Advocate, so it's just a chump block and not a trade. But JC valuing keeping the loyalty on Obnixilus high, as you might imagine. Oh, here's Kalidus now for JC as well. And JC is just getting zombies. He Let's see if he hits his land for the turn as well. God, he has that too. Yep. 
How do you feel about zombies? And a Shia token as well. Yeah, JC knows that it is time for him to go into overdrive. Yeah, he's presenting lethal on the board. And he gets another zombie, of course, from that oath. And that's game. Michael Hans just flooded out there. Tough game two for him. I mean, we have to give credit to JC there, right? JC is the one who played two transgresses and took the two, two of the major cards away from Michael there, right? I mean, taking that season's pass was a big deal. Right, and, and same thing with the Dark Petition. Those were cards that, that Michael could have used to find answers or to get back in the game. And then Michael did draw a few too many lands in the middle part of the game to really put up a fight. JC Tao. Dear God. Pro Tour champion, really. Still undefeated, Tenno. Showing everybody that he is uh, very what much the, the real deal here. Well... Jake, you want to take a stab at this board state, buddy? All right. So this is a, this is a <laughs> muddled board to say the least. Although to be fair, the actual creatures on board, there's only three creatures versus two in a planeswalker. It's not that bad. Yeah, those great those graveyards matter a lot, though. Yeah, uh, they do. Especially on the right side of the table. Life totals look like they're relatively close. It doesn't seem like either player's really been able to dig their claws in just yet. No. See that spirit left over from a uh, from copy a of Haunted Dead. Haunted Dead, okay. In the battlefield, and a surprising amount of long-term action. Yeah, this is that same game that we jumped in on, by the way. So there's going to be, in the exile pile, you can't quite see it, but there'll be a couple of prized amalgams in there that we saw get nabbed by, I believe, Transgress the Mines earlier in the game. I see a Dragonlord Silumgar in Sinsui's hand. Oh. Oh, he's thinking about when he wants to fire that off. <laughs> Christian Keith has F6. Did you see that? <laughs> he even pushed the button for us there. I and like it. People that play on Magic Online will get that reference. And that is actually a pretty sportsmanlike gesture. It just means that Christian says, I will not interact with you. on the, Like, I'm not going to counter anything. I'm not going to activate anything. I might block. Yeah, I mean, but they're in game it. three. There's 10 minutes left. This yeah. game could conceivably go a lot longer. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, that's the kind of thing that can be nice, you know, when your opponent is reasonably casting a spell and saying, does this resolve? And, like, you know, you just don't want to assume anything about what your opponent could or couldn't have in their hand. But this is Christian saying, don't worry about it. If you're casting it, it's resolving. If you're activating it, it's going to happen. Just, just do your thing. All right, now we're going to read an Elder Deep Fiend here. You cannot, the spirit does not have a mana cost, so it will not reduce it. I guess you could sack it. I just wouldn't, it just doesn't change the delve cost if that's what he's wondering about. I don't know what he's asking, though. Yeah, this is odd because I think Christian has a copy of Emrakul in his hand. So once in Sweet passes the turn here, he's really got to figure out a way to mitigate the damage that's going to happen. Oh, interesting. Just off camera there, there was a Jace on some number of loyalty above six. Oh, wow. That, that thing could be ready to ult ultimate here. Maybe, maybe we can have him move that down just a little because I can't get an idea for what that other die reads. I'm assuming it's one or two. We see here how good those transgresses early in the game were for Christian, that he was able to take those two prized amalgams. No kidding. Imagine how many times those would have looped by this point. All right, so what's happened here is we, he's minus Jace to play Traverse and got an island? Yeah. It that looks puts him like to it. seven lands here untapped. What does he have in mind?
Looks like he's going to cast that Elder Deep Fiend. Yeah, I mean, he needs to. He may know about the Emrakul in, the other, in uh, Christian's hand, but... Uh, I think what he really needs to be doing is just prevent that from being cast as long as possible. Maybe he can win the game before that. And he uh, is able to cast that Elder Deep Fiend for seven. Well, yeah, for the, it's the full emerge cost, but yeah. wh where did that spirit go? That's the thing I have not been able to figure out, Jake, is that he threw a spirit away there, and I don't know. Well, that's the thing he is he, he had to pay seven for it as opposed to paying eight, so he was able to sacrifice the spirit. But the spirit has no mana cost, right? Yeah, so it doesn't reduce the He just needs to sacrifice cost. a creature to, to be able to pay it. Yeah, to be able to pay. Oh, okay, that, pay that's what seven. I was asking about. Is, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's not making it any cheaper there, but it's part of the cost to sacrifice a creature is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, well, normally it costs eight, and the emerge cost is seven. Mm -hmm. So by sacrificing the spirit, he could play it for seven as opposed to having to... Gotcha. Good. That's what I was asking about. Yeah. Glad you caught up. But yeah, like you said, he's using that as a primarily defensive measure to keep Christian Keith off of casting Emrakul, right? Yeah, and he needs to do that. I mean, once Christian casts the Emrakul, it's obviously bad news for Zin Sui. At this point, though, Zin Sui's putting together a pretty impressive board. I'm really interested to know just how many counters are on that Jace. So did you see what happened at the end there? <laughs> so Jin said, I attack you, and Christian's dead. Yeah. <laughs> but he says, attack, attack Nissa? And he's like, no, dude, you. <laughs> Obviously, I'm attacking you. Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think a little bit of fun there from Christian down the stretch. But that is the match going to Jin. So he is going to. What was his record coming in? He was undefeated as well. So we have our last two undefeated players, Jin Sui and uh, JC Tao are the last two players standing at 10-0, yep. and, and that's going to leave us with just one match left. So the two 10 is facing off. It will be a four-color prized amalgam and Obzon Control. Cool. Kind of awesome. Those aren't band company mirrors. Those right. are not band company mirrors. That will do it for round number 10 here from Portland. Up your game with Ultra Pro Magic the Gathering accessories. Find the best magic art on card sleeves, deck boxes, playmats, and more. Visit ultrapro.com to learn more and find a retailer near you. Friday Night Magic is your local hangout where everyone is welcome. Gather with friends at your favorite game store every Friday night. For more info, visit magic.wizards.com slash FNM. You have to win so many matches to top eight of a pro tour. It's unbelievable. Like I, I've I've played in like about ten pro tours, and I never, I honestly never thought I would top eight a pro tour. You know, it's it's kind of like a situation where I had gone, I'd went eleven and five, and just done done just well enough to keep playing in them, but I had never really broken through. And it just seemed once I was there on the stage, it just felt 
it, it, it was unbelievable. It, it was really, it was really fun. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, winning the Magic World Championship would be a, a complete fulfillment. I mean, there's nothing else I've already won a Pro Tour. You know, that's pretty much the next step for me would be would be to to win the World Championships. So. Here at Grand Prix Portland, Brian David Marshall here with Reed Duke. We are about to watch our time walk match here in uh, round one of day two, otherwise known as round 10. And it's uh, between Jerry Thompson and Eugene Huang. And both players are on band company. Let's take a look at what's going on. We're going to pick it up in game two with Jerry Thompson up a game. Okay, doesn't sound like we're going to be able to do that. 